1992 was a year of kings. There was the LAPD beating of Rodney King, videotaped from an apartment balcony, and the hovering coverage of TV cameras and helicopters circling the city as the public rebelled. It was nearly 25 years after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King and Bill Clinton, a child of the 60s, was campaigning to become commander-in-chief, a king among the contenders. Hold on just a minute, here's Larry King. Hello? Then there was Larry King, who was anointed as the father of talk show democracy because TV viewers could phone his program and ask the candidates questions on the air. The viewer calls to King's show was seen as a seat of a future TV democracy in which citizens could vote for a candidate or pending legislation by picking up a special remote control and voting yes or no. Taking viewer calls on Larry King's show is TV evangelist Pat Robertson, whose organization, the Christian Coalition, seeks working control of the Republican Party by 1996. I'd like to ask Mr. Robertson two quick questions. One, what he thought about the Bush quail commercials. Were they effective? Should they have had more family values on them? Also, how can you say you want a party of inclusion when you're so blatantly anti-gay? Behind the scenes and off the air, Robertson's media advisor tells Robertson how to turn around or spin the caller's question. You can talk about anything you want to. Well, I am moved. I want a kinder and gentler nation. This Bush campaign phrase was written by spin doctor and speechwriter Peggy Noonan. Because America is so infused by media that we are all spinning in a way. Uh, that it is, that it is... We're uh, embellishing our story. Uh, embellishment is okay. There's... Uh, What's not okay? Where does, uh, where does spin the begin? The disingenuous part. The, the calculating this isn't the whole truth part. If he tries to corner you on the can and do the same thing, slide off it. Go back to the inclusion. Mm. You gotta get you gotta you expand the party and you gotta bring everybody together. You can't worry about the problems of nineteen ninety two, you gotta look ahead to ninety six. Mm -hmm. Focus on the future. I so to speak. Okay. Uh, Anyone with a home satellite TV system, like the ones you see in bars or in people's yards, could have picked up Robertson and his spin doctor chatting off air. Dish owners are able to receive two types of TV. One is the regular TV programming you normally see on cable or the broadcast networks. Is that uh, Helmstead still the next one? The other type of TV is the satellite feed. In this case, the feed of George Bush and Larry King chatting during a commercial break. Kind of weird being seen around the world. Yeah. Technology. Amazing. Saddam Hussein is watching this during this. Satellite feeds are used by the networks to transmit images of news events from around the world. An event covered by the network is transmitted up into space to a satellite. The satellite receives and retransmits the image of the event back down to Earth to the network's headquarters where the video image is edited and contextualized as television. The home satellite dish owner can watch regular TV, or they can tune in the satellite feed and see the event before it has been packaged by the networks as television. In 1992, I bought a couple of satellite dishes and spent the entire year flipping through the channels looking for feeds. I'd lock onto a satellite and go channel by channel through its transmission, recording the feeds. Then I would move on to the next satellite, and the next one, and the next one. By the end of the year, I'd recorded more than 500 hours of feeds. Don't put a lot of that uh, garbage on it. What is this? Are we on the national 
Can we turn that off? I don't want to be on national television being this um, made up. Some of the feed guests knew, and some didn't know, their images were being broadcast, unscrambled and visible, to over three and a half million dish owners across North America. Those who knew they were being watched attempted to stay out of satellite TV's wide frame. But after spending hours a day inside of a television studio, television had become their home. Nineteen ninety one and ninety two had been years of political extremes for George Bush. After the Gulf War in nineteen ninety one, he had the highest approval rating of any president in modern history. But as the U.S. economy fell, so did Bush's ratings and his health. He and the First Lady Barbara Bush developed a thyroid condition known as Graves' disease. As Bush's ratings fell further, he decided to appear on Larry King's show. His appearance marked the first time a U.S. president had been on a call and talk show in over 15 years. You feeling well, by the way? Yeah. Are you feeling well? Good, good. Lucky. Running still and played tennis yesterday. What is that disease you had? Um, um, what are they? They they drug treat it, right? They could take a drug every single morning, a little blue spin, Synthroid or something. And it wasn't hard. It's what the it's what the thyroid does to make your heart fibrillate, which has been very good. Now I took Halcyon for a long time after my heart surgery. Are you off the I don't know that it's bad, I think. It's the best sleeping pill in the world, but not daily. No, oh no. Okay. No, it's got such a bad rap. Halcyon had gotten such a bad rap that its product license in Britain was provisionally withdrawn. Some users of the drug complained of amnesia, anxiety, delusions, and hostility. When Bush started the election year, he was taking a sedative during a visit to Japan when he fainted and threw up on the Japanese prime minister. For Bush, the image of the event could have been devastating. News stories of Jimmy Carter's fainting created a symbol of a failed president. It haunted Carter throughout his campaign and helped Ronald Reagan reach the White House. The first minute of Bush's fainting episode and the reaction of the frightened dinner guest was not released by the networks and is not seen here. Only this footage after the initial fainting was made public. Newsweek magazine published a story about the event with photographs from the censored Bush fainting episode, but the photographs obscured the view of the president's face. All traces of Bush's nauseating performance would be cleaned up by the White House television crew. Even this mantle photo of Bush's face next to a white baby's blanket may have looked too much like his face in Barbara's white napkin in Japan. You want to take one of the, Anna? You got it. Do whatever you need to do. So to speak. This is the White House television studio, the satellite TV hub, which the president used to make news. From the White House studio, Bush would go up on a satellite, give a five-minute interview with a local news anchor, disconnect, hook up with another local news anchor, give an interview, disconnect, hook up with another one, and do this again and again and again. This type of satellite whistle-stop campaigning is called the satellite tour. This is a technician at the White House hooking up with TV stations in South Carolina and Florida for a satellite tour by Barbara Bush. Channel 4, do you read us in Washington? WYFF. Come in, come in. Remember that every single man, woman, and child in the state of South Carolina awakens to a freer, safer world because of George Bush. WIS, do you hear us in Washington? I would remind people that every single morning we all awaken to a safer, freer world because of George Bush.
WCBD, do you hear us in Washington? And Nicole, I would remind you and the people of Florence that all of us awaken every single day to a freer, safer world because of George Bush. WCSC, do you read us in Washington? They themselves awaken every single day to a freer, safer world because of George Bush. Campaigning via the satellite tour allowed the candidates to cover long distances. But there was another major benefit. They could bypass the national TV networks. There was no need to feed through the TV network center and on to the local stations. The campaign was now the center and its own television network. This is great. I love these. Can we do any more? Can we do some now? We do those two now. Got to do some more in Florida and Texas. Have we done all of Colorado today? Yeah, we've got one more Today. Another way the candidates made news was by creating their own TV news stories called the video news release. The video news release was given free of charge to local TV stations. Sent via satellite by the candidate, the video news release consisted of a campaign-produced TV news segment, complete with intro text for the local TV anchor to read, and a news story edited by the campaign. I feel I have the experience and leadership to take America in new directions. One new direction, Job Training 2000, Mr. Bush's plan to retrain blue-collar workers and the unemployed for new job opportunities. The country's 11 largest business organizations endorsed... Nearly all the major candidates placed a video news release on local television, and nearly half the local TV stations which aired the releases didn't report that they had been produced by the candidate. For instance, this story's reporter, Michael Caputo, wouldn't be identified as working for the Bush campaign. Primary is March 17th. In Washington, this is Michael Caputo reporting. The campaigns had to pay out of their own pockets to produce the satellite media tours and video news releases. But their best and cheapest way of making news was through the TV talk shows. And the candidate's talk show of choice was CNN's Larry King Live, which made the front page of the New York Times 57 times during the election year. For Al Gore was famous, Tammy. <laughs> he, on his book tour, he drove over to Mutual Network all by himself, came up in that great Crystal City elevator. I still remember the day I became famous. Yeah. When your column in USA Today came in. On that thing, that book. <laughs> I always remember the cards you sent me. For the networks, making news meant making profits, as the candidates made nearly 100 talk show appearances. Tell Bill if he'd do that thing in New York, it'd be terrific. He's so good at this. Clinton's. Yeah, yeah. One of the problems with staying on a bus too long is the two of you guys are so good on media. Towards the end of the election, candidate appearances increased TV talk show ratings an average of 40%. You know what you ought to do? You ought to come out on the uh, bus. bus trip with us uh, one day. We could do a, we could do a joint uh, interview from the bus. Larry King said the campaign ratings bonanza turned the election into a TV miniseries like Roots or the Thornbirds. We're out of time. You can invite us on the bus. Okay. Uh, we have plum run out of time. Thanks for coming, Al. I pre I'd like to invite you to come on the bus with us. 1992 was probably an historic first as a major network's advertising revenues from its political coverage made more money than it cost to report the campaign. For CNN, the election was a watershed as the network received its highest ratings since the Gulf War. But I want him to finish the thought here. That's the one break we have to hit live. It's, it's an around the world break. It's hard to believe we're being watched in 151 countries. It's scary. I go, I'm in Israel. I'm at the Wailing Wall. True story. Israel. Never been there before. There with my brother. I'm Jewish. It's my culture. I'm standing there as an old rabbi, dominating. He's praying. He's an old, a religious Jewish man. 
He looks up at me and he says, what's with Perot? <laughs> Swear to God, what's with Perot? In Israel. I love it. <laughs> it's crazy. Ted Turner changed the world. He's a big fan of yours. Is he? He would uh, serve you, Captain. You know what I mean? I don't know. I'm surprised. He's ready. What's he gonna? What's he got left in life? The game. I don't know. After you're elected, think about it. No dope. That's for sure. <laughs> Great guy to work for. Too. Amid a continuing allegations of tabloid reports pointing to extramarital affairs, Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton is this noon campaigning across the South. Hello, Mike. Everybody in America who's had problems in their marriage, who either wound up divorced or who got back together, votes for me. I'm a shoe in. Can you hear me? I figure if everybody in Maryland who's ever had trouble in their marriage and they're still together, or who's ever been divorced, votes for me. I'm a shoe in. Hello. Uh, hello? And you know, if every American couple who's either been divorced or had problems and stayed married, votes for me, I'm a shoe in for re-election. I think the American people are smarter than the pundits. Before Clinton was shooed into office, he had to compete against a host of other Democratic candidates. The media focused on four of these candidates, but Larry Agron was a fifth candidate the press did not report on. There's no makeup here? During the 1992 U.S. Conference of Mayors, the New York Times reported that, quote, dozens of mayors seem to agree on one thing. The single candidate who truly understands urban needs is Larry Agron, unquote. They promised to bring this stuff over. None of the networks mentioned Agron's presence at the convention. I thought if I run over that super One of Agron's staff had to run over to the super saver and buy some makeup because the network had broken its promise to provide it. This was typical of the media's treatment of Agron. When he appeared at this Democratic candidate's forum, this Associated Press photo simply cropped Agron out of the frame. During the New Hampshire primary, the TV news reported the polling numbers of the top five Democratic candidates, Brown, Clinton, Harkin, Kerry, and Songus. When Agron moved into a three-way tie with Harkin and Brown with 2% of the vote, most of the TV news didn't mention Agron. The day Bill Clinton captured what may have been the most valuable airtime of the entire election as he spoke to 50 million viewers about his alleged affair was the same day that a poll showed Agron's support at 4%. He had passed Brown and was the fifth leading candidate. When ABC's Sunday Evening News reported this poll, they simply deleted Agron entirely by not reporting his candidacy. During the New Hampshire primary, Agron's only live commercial TV appearance was through this satellite feed to ABC's Nightline. But the Nightline program wasn't directly about the election. When Agron complained to news executives about his lack of coverage, he was told he had not earned the right to media exposure because he had not received enough media exposure. And on stage, the five major contenders for the Democratic presidential nomination. Although Agron was on the ballot in nearly half the country, he was barred from most televised debates, including this one sponsored by the League of Women Voters. He couldn't meet one of the League's main criteria, which was, quote, recognition by the national media as a candidate meriting media attention, unquote. Good evening and welcome to the Democratic presidential candidates debate on urban America. Agron wanted to debate on urban America, calling for a 50% cut in defense spending and the reinvestment of some of that money into America's decaying cities. We are going to be coming to you rather live from Lehman College and you'll hear a bit of a disturbance in the background, but we'll go on with that in any case. The disturbance is Larry Agron asking to be included in the debate so that he can explain his plans for defense cuts and urban revitalization. Johnsboro President Ferdinand Ferrer and Mr. President, I suggest you wait for just a moment till the man is quieted or chooses to quiet down. I respectfully request inclusion 
All right. Mr. Mr. Agron was quickly arrested. His court date fell on the first day of the Democratic National Convention. During this campaign, but very little said about the problems facing America's cities. Tonight, we'll change all that. Without media exposure and the debates, Agron couldn't quickly receive federal campaign funds, and his candidacy lost momentum. Uh, you look all right on camera. What's that? You look all right. There's no hot spots. So. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, you say I got a mustache that shows through here. Okay, Why don't you go get some stuff, Mike? Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> Campaign funds. The Democratic Party refused to include Agron in the debates or speak to the networks on his behalf. Agron talked about his exclusion, saying, I've challenged my own party for its continuing complicity in Cold War thinking, Cold War rhetoric, and Cold War budgets. To restore order right now, there are 3,000 National Guardsmen on duty in the city of Los Angeles. Another 2,200 stand ready to provide immediate support. I, so to speak. Okay. Let me see. Fall. So to speak. Okay. Let me see. Fall. Oh, what a beautiful morning. In 1992, the networks had their own solutions for urban decay. This morning we are here looking for solutions. CBS looked for solutions at L.A.'s Martin Luther King Hospital. Well, a hospital like Martin Luther King can see more trauma than all of Western Europe does in a year. Mm. In fact, there's so much trauma there that the U.S. Army sends its combat surgeons there so they get a sense of what these very severe wounds were like. In fact, when I was in the Gulf War, a number of the senior combat surgeons had trained right here at Martin Luther King mm. Hospital. Dr. Bob, thanks. Before he went on air, part of Dr. Bob's diagnosis was cut out because it was too obtuse. Yeah, so what's your impression? I said, my impression is, you know, places like South Central LA around the country look more and more like real third world countries or third world countries without the hope. That is, they had no medical care, they had no real economy, and, um, they, and yet, in a third world country, it's developing. There's some onward development. There's some 30. vision for the future. Well, you have your, your impressions of the medical care are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I think that gets too obtuse. How about, how about if I were to ask about the level of the, the trauma care here? has always been considered superior, has it not, to other parts of the country? Cook, yeah, 30 seconds. Yeah, it's the best, the best. You know, Can I, why don't I say something like that? Okay. Yeah. As the conditions of the cities became obtuse to the networks, they turned to the suburbs to render a verdict on the campaign. And later, I on the campaign, you will see and hear some of the suburban voters who may very well decide this election. Back now live from St. Louis, there is news far beyond this city tonight. In, uh, what is this, in Hawaii? Hey. Uh, in Haiti. Oh, ho, ho, ho. well, they all look alike to me. <laughs> In Haiti, a huge explosion leveled a three-story building in downtown Port-au-Prince. At least 15 Haitians were killed. Take a look at the roads leading into and out of Los Angeles. Lately, you see more taillights than headlights. A lot of people leaving this town for good. Where are they going? Anywhere else. Why? While the ethnically diverse cities were abandoned for the homogeneous suburbs, the networks created their own recipes for the melting pot. Make a note. Give it to Kathy, who may be the best at this. Since we're going to wish uh, people a happy Rosh Hashanah, which is my idea and a good idea, just don't forget to check when Ramadan is. We have to wish all of our Muslim friends happy Ramadan. And then behind that, when you get to the Buddhist New Year, the year of the rat or the year of the monkey, whatever it is, we have to... We've got to be politically correct here, pal. After four Los Angeles police officers were found not guilty of assaulting Rodney King, the TV news moved away from the residents of L.A. and into the sky with 13 television-equipped helicopters. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. I'm sorry, we're, we're still hung up in our court here. Um, they're just marching up and down the streets, and they formed a big 
bulkhead here at the end of the, at the corner. The distant coverage in the sky was emulated on the ground by the scarce street reporters who tried to glide by without speaking to the protesters of the verdict. With the chance, no justice, no peace is what they're chanting. No peace. No justice, no peace. You can hear them now. No peace. We can stick no going here. No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. No justice. No, no peace. We ain't this got men to change, people. We don't have men to there should never have been a change of venue. No justice. There should no never have been a change no of venue. Justice. And as a result, this is what you have. This is what you have. There's not clips down here. There's no bloods down here. There's just concerned citizens down here that don't like the way the system is done. This is what we're talking about. Could you tell me, sir? Could you tell me? Could you tell me? The police are closing in. They're Okay, they were off. You did that. They cut us. The voiceless scenes from South Central L.A., where nearly 50% of the children live in poverty, was contextualized by the $600,000 a year TV news anchors. As the looting goes on in a senseless fashion, people arguing for sanity on the one hand, simultaneous looting in a random fashion for things that people can't even use. 25 years ago, the media's coverage of the riots in the Watts area of Los Angeles was called racially divisive by the federally empowered Kerner Commission. The commission was formed in order to find the root causes of the urban violence of the late 1960s. It found that one cause was the massive economic collapse and poverty of the cities. The other was the media. The Kerner Commission found the media guilty of failing to communicate to all ethnic groups the complex and fundamental problems of race relations. This L.A. news anchor made these comments moments before reporting the verdict in the second LAPD beating trial of Rodney King. Okay, I'm standing by, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have shit to say. We don't have anything to do. But by God, the management of this company deems it necessary that I come on the morning and shock the shit out of all of you. In just half an hour from now, the jury in the federal Rodney King beating trial will be back in session. The Kerner Commission said media's failure to communicate was caused in part by the media's shockingly backward hiring practices. Hardly any people of color worked as TV news directors, the people who set policy and make decisions. Television responded to the criticism by hiring cameramen, clerks, and makeup artists that were African American, Latino, and Asian American. For each of these ethnic groups, the number of TV news directors is a few percentage points above zero since the Kerner Commission's verdict 25 years ago. You, you announced that they get rid of their gates tomorrow and they'll stop tomorrow. You announced that. As the networks covered over the voices from L.A., the candidates told the story of their own. I felt anger. I felt pain. And I thought, how can I explain this to my grandchildren? And given the fact that this is a presidential election year, it's also a challenge to the man who would challenge the president for the country's leadership. Of course, everyone knows the old rhyme. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. We know his voyage took him to the New World, and his arrival changed the world forever. But beyond that, much about Columbus remains the subject of some dispute. During the celebration of the 500th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of the Americas, the only satellite feed I found with a Native American guest was this feed to a local morning talk show. The guest is a historian and a member of the Cherokee Nation. Yes, you, you said he presided over over a death of a quarter of a million people. No, that yeah. wasn't at his own hand. That was well, others who followed him and over, disease over, and that sort of thing. No, but he couldn't control, no I'm talking about like his first two years here, a quarter of a million. 
it's pretty well documented. He took uh, his interpreters, he took his his guides as slaves. Uh, he chopped off the hands of anyone over 14, any male over 14 who couldn't bring in gold. He took women as sex slaves for his men. Dr. Matei, I want you to thank you very much for coming by. Thanks for spending some time with us this morning on the Good Morning Show. You're welcome. That was brief. <laughs> okay. Hopefully painless, sir. The painful lessons of Columbus's past were never mentioned as the networks debated his legacy. Interesting debate. I'm not sure we settled it this morning, but we'll we appreciate on. trying. We'll That's true. On. Thank you both. Thank you. And we'll be back with more of our special edition of today on Governor's Island right after this. What did he say to many cents? Anything? They just, you know, think that yeah, he ruined right. the paradise and had no respect for nature and treated the Indians like dog do and... What the hell is he doing? Wait a minute. Okay. Hi. So to speak. I think I'm pregnant. The woman on the screen is Murphy Brown, a fictional TV sitcom character. Doesn't help matters when primetime TV has Murphy Brown. He is talking about you. Vice President Dan Quill blamed the L.A. riots on its citizens' lack of family values, instilled in part by the Murphy Brown TV character. He said it was not economic poverty, but rather a poverty of values promoted by the Brown character, which caused the burning of L.A. Highly paid professional woman, <laughs> mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone and calling it just another lifestyle choice. Politicizing sexuality was not new to Washington. I'm an executive producer. I'll just executive produce this baby. Sexual politics helped Ronald Reagan reach the White House and gave birth to the new religious right. <laughs> After the Republicans lost the presidency to Jimmy Carter, some conservatives theorized if the Republican Party would oppose abortion, they could split the strong Catholic voting bloc of the Democrats and elect a Reagan and Bush ticket to the White House. As a senator, George Bush was against outlawing abortion. But as Reagan's vice presidential running mate, Bush changed his position and supported a ban on abortion. Well, you haven't given us any specificity about where you stand on it, Senator. In the past, particularly in the House of Representatives, you voted against federal funding for abortions, and that meant for poor women. In some circumstances. Well, tell us the, the circumstances, please. All right. The, the circumstances debated have in, involved a rape and incest and life uh, where the life of the mother is in jail. As a congressman, Al Gore voted against using federal funds for abortion. But as a vice presidential candidate, he changed his position and supported using federal funds for abortion as part of the Clinton health care plan. That's what freedom is all about. That's what tolerance is all about. That's what our country stands for. Well, I, I'm still confused. I'll try one more time. When you voted against federal funding for abortions, <clears throat> except under the three circumstances you outlined, had your vote carried the day, you would have imposed your belief on poor women in this country. There was no and there is no national health insurance program today. Uh, we do not have the kind of comprehensive coverage. After the abortion questions, Gore's media advisor tells him how to turn around or spin the A question. and the president of the Christian Broadcasting Network, Mr. Pat Robertson. The 1992 Republican National Platform called for a complete ban on abortion, 
Nearly 30 percent of the platform committee was controlled by the Christian Coalition and its president, Pat Robertson. The goal of Robertson's Christian Coalition is to gain working control of the Republican Party by 1996. I have two television networks. I have three radio news networks. I'm starting Standard News. I have 50 uh, reporters right now working for me that are very fine. Robertson's reporters work for his Christian Broadcasting Network, or CBN. Through the 700 Club, CBN News reports reach over 43 million homes in the U.S. Operation Rescue has targeted five abortion clinics in Buffalo for a minimum of two weeks of activities aimed at shutting the facilities down. In 1992, Operation Rescue was a top news story for CBN. A battle both sides vow to win. Andrea Francis, CBN News. On the first day of the Republican National Convention, Operation Rescue broke through this line of clinic defenders and blockaded an abortion clinic near the convention site. <laughs> That same day, Robertson had this discussion with a CBN staff person. I have sent word to keep that operation rescue. I don't want one word on this program this week about operation rescue. Well, not we're, we're one. Not. We're not. I don't want to cover it. I don't want to talk about it. And I want to work. That same morning, Republicans who supported women's right to choose an abortion held a rally in Houston led by Ann Stone. And I will go much I mean, we felt like we should cover it. In Don't the cover anything about the abortion debate any longer. It doesn't matter. They passed the platform. And we need to get cameras covering our rally, our guys. Oh, we're there. We're going to be there. And no, it was, was it start? Uh, and then you need cameras it's shooting time for people President George Bush. or me sitting in the okay. vice president's spot. Mm -hmm. But I believe in objective news. I believe in balanced news. I don't want to slant the news. I just want to tell it like it is. How many cameras? We'll just yeah, just drop a camera crew. We have two here. Yeah. All right. Get two reporters. Yeah. And you stick those cameras in place anybody you want to. And start asking the questions. Hey, Luke. Ask the tough questions. Ask the I let them know questions. right now we haven't seen you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, get out there. Don't even say who you're from. He doesn't show that we'll just go from the east. What do you think is the president of the court tax? Do you think this thing is breaking up? It might be a military gimmick. Do you think that's an election? I mean, stick it to the court. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, and, and cameras right in their face. Sorry, Sam, go up and ask you a question. Boom. I'm not sure getting you on the radio is going to be much. We'll do. We'll do it. <laughs> we think we want to reach out. We play hardball. We play hardball. I'm not sure that this point is going to go up. Televangelists play some of their hardest ball at the expense of the gay community by using the AIDS crisis. 152.796. It was the speaker, but we made it. By 1985, viewers were giving an estimated $100 million a year to Robertson's TV program. When televangelist Jim Baker was sent to prison for mail fraud and Jimmy Swaggart was caught with a prostitute, fewer donations to televangelism plummeted. A lot of uh, broadcasters are gone. Some needed to, some it was financial pressure. Televangelist Jerry Falwell's ministry was nearly bankrupt. Then he sent out a fundraising letter which claimed AIDS-infected homosexuals were purposefully infecting citizens by knowingly giving their AIDS-infected blood to blood banks. In the fundraising letter, Falwell said, quote, they know they are going to die and they are going to take as many people with them as they can, unquote. His ministry was revived. Seventy-five years ago, a plague descended upon the world and covered the nations of Eastern Europe like a dark cloud. But ladies and gentlemen, a more benign but equally insidious plague has fastened itself upon the families of America. At the Republican National Convention, Robertson characterized communism and government bureaucracies as plagues, a thinly veiled reference to the AIDS crisis. 
Robertson supports the theory that gays have conspired with other supposedly subversive agents in order to undermine the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, the carrier of this plague is the Democrat Party. Um, that Republican convention was one of the most hateful things. I'm a Republican, but I'll tell you what, Pat Robertson personally was one of the reasons why I voted against George Bush. Okay, now, Pat, he's saying you would not let a pro-choice person chair your party, or you would try to stop it. He just uh, contradicted what I just said. I'm sitting here in this chair telling you something different, and he said I won't do it. How does he know what I'll do? Uh, I, I think... Uh, uh, if he obviously didn't hear my speech at the convention because it closed with a beautiful story of a lovely lady holding a little uh, a starving child in her arm, and uh, it was a call uh, for a, a better world and, and one nation under God. I can't see how anybody said that was hateful. I don't know where he's coming from, but there's something there that is not uh, just on the surface, I think, because I didn't say the things he said I did. We'll be right back with Pat Robertson and Lynn Martin and more of your phone calls on Larry King Live. Then Tina Sinatra. Don't go away. What's that? Did you get a good question? No. This last one? Well, the last one, I, but yeah, I, I, I didn't get it. I said, who in the heck is screening these calls? I've had one person call him a bigot. I've had another person call him a zealot. Let's, let's get some balance out there. Well, the last one's too late. Uh -huh. The last one's okay, but the first three were all homosexuals. I know. I know. I've had this you before. Can you can answer the question any way you choose to. I hear you. All right? Remember, so take, take it where you want it to go. Take it where you want it to go. I don't like the producer of this segment. Well, they, it's, uh, they were trying to set me up. Yeah. That's what they told me. And that's what the Harris people told me. Did, did they accomplish it, or, or have I come back around? No, I think you're fine. I think that I'm just very upset. Yeah. Well. You, it hasn't come across any place as angry. Oh, no, I'm not angry. He's angry. You look good. You know? I'm saying good. I think they'll be out of here in about another. I hear you. You're right. Hi. So to speak. According to research and polls on the 1992 election, the information source which Americans valued more than TV news and TV talk shows was the presidential debates. And this would mean that there would be four televised presidential debates, more than ever held in any presidential election. And if Governor Clinton is serious about debating, he will accept this challenge and he will instruct his campaign officials to meet promptly with my campaign officials to work out the de details directly between the parties. Let's get it on. Bill, baby, let's do it. Get it on, as we say. Let's get up there and get it on, side by side. Sunday night, Mr. Bush is going to go on Larry King Live. So what I think is, Larry King ought to have us both on there and let the American people call their questions in. That's what we ought to do. Then... Then we get the best of both worlds, one moderator and millions of questioners. I think it would really be a great thing. So I've asked our people to contact Larry King and see if we can arrange it. I'm ready to go. Let's get it on. Hi, um, Tom, can you hear me? Yeah. They've just confirmed both sides. They're meeting at 8 o'clock tonight. Okay. Um, I think it's at Mickey's office. Malik, Teeter, Darman will attend for the president, and they have turned down Larry King. So I've rewritten my live lead. After Bush turned down Larry King's show as the site of the first presidential debate, the debate over who would be moderator of the debates continued, as seen in these satellite feeds, recorded over a 10-day period. 
Al looks great. You saw where he proposed you as the moderator of the debates. Who? What, didn't we? Uh, I think we did. Yeah. Oh, when, so. Well, when, when he was going when the yeah. president was going to be on I'd the show. I'd be happy to be at it. That shocks me. I, I think they did. I think I'd be a fair amount. Of, you'd get a very fair. Well, yep. I do too. I'm the fairest person, I think. I'll let you know. Right, right on. You're doing great. I will tell you. I'll be the first to tell you. Did they pick the journalists today for St. Louis? Mm -hmm. Did they pick the reporters? Not yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. And I still think, you know, there's a lot of narrative. Who's on on Sunday night? We know yet. Yeah. No, the moderator. I don't think we know yet. No, it hadn't been chosen. But you have input. They have input. Pro has input. That's correct. Right, right up my alley. That stuff right up my alley. No one would get it in the edge. What's that? Be fair. You'll sit best in the debates because you don't come with any baggage. You could elevate it every time they talk about something silly. You just say, come on. What are we wasting time? To me, you sit very effective. You could affect, have a great effect on this life. Just let's go get it on. Get it on, so to speak. King was never chosen as a moderator of the debates. Good evening and welcome to the second of three presidential debates between the major candidates for president of the United States. So, President Bush, I think you said it earlier, let's get it on. Good morning. The latest presidential polls show President Bush is closing in on Bill Clinton in the final week before the election. One poll shows the two candidates are almost even. A CNN USA Today poll shows Clinton and Bush virtually deadlocked. Four days before the election, George Bush made his final appearance as president on Larry King's show. What a night, what a finish. What a year for me. Huh? A year for me, it's been unbelievable changed the world. It's uh, different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Strangest year in the history of me. <laughs> I hear you, Tom. Tell me about it. What? Tell me about it. <laughs> Hold on. God, I got a darn cold. A cold fever. Some of my brothers in the drug business, all the coins. Slight cold. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Right ahead, a historic evening. 90-minute special, Larry King Live, with the President of the United States and your phone calls. It's next from Racine, Wisconsin. Don't go away. <laughs> My brother's in the pharmaceutical business. He said that there's a new pill coming from Israel, better than house -y. I mean, for sleeping, or beats a difference. Great. I... So to speak. You see? Well... So to speak. You see? You see? We're back. It's now uh, shortly after 9 o'clock in the east. Polls are still open in the west, of course, in the mountain time zone as well.
Here's a winner in the Rocky Mountain states, Colorado, eight electoral votes. Perot was a big factor. Taking away Three years after Bush's defeat, the Christian coalition tripled its active membership to one and a half million members. Clinton's taken New Mexico, according to them. Its annual budget has more than doubled, and the coalition holds virtual veto power over the Republican nominee for president in 1996. Rhode Island. Delaware. Mr. Roberts, would you like to or reorganize the Republican Party around the Christian tenets that you hold so dear? I would like to see a winning coalition like Ronald Reagan had. I think we've got to get economic conservatives together with social conservatives and some who are foreign policy advocates of the foreign policy initiatives that we've seen very successfully over the last 10 or 12 years and to put together that coalition. And I, I think that uh, the last thing we need is recrimination and finger pointing and that sort of thing. It's good. The Republican Party will probably have a splendid opportunity uh, if we have some economic collapse in the next two or three years to come back strong in 96. Pat Robertson, thank you very much. Thanks. Frank Gumbel? Tom, that's the closest we've seen to the start of uh, what might be a, a round of finger pointing. Uh, how much of it do you think we are going to see? Well, I think that the Pat Robertson movement, and he's not the only one who's involved in it, is very important and to some Republicans a little terrifying right now because they're very well organized. He says we're very important and very well organized in county by county. Yes, the new religious run. They'll, they'll organize out of sight of the conventional machinery and then go out and win. It was reported after the election that the Clinton White House uses the Department of Defense to intercept satellite TV feeds on a regular basis. This monitoring practice started during the 1992 election, as Al Gore's wife, Tipper, found out during the campaign. Everyone's watching you on Little Rock. They're watching these satellite feeds? Oh, yeah, we can, you know, that we, pick, we pull it whenever any of you all do a satellite tour, they pull it down on the Little Rock on all the monitors and the whole headquarters. Just the actual interviews, not this part. The Clinton campaign also intercepted the satellite feeds of the TV network news. Clinton strategists would watch the network's satellite feed of a network news story about Clinton. This would give the strategists the ability to respond to the story before it ever aired on regular network television. Clearly, this goal is almost within reach. But he's trying to lift his sights beyond the attack colleges. Four years. Feeling that his goal is almost within reach, Clinton is now trying to lift his sights beyond the attack politics of the campaign. Clinton also monitored the satellite feeds of his opponents. According to the American Journalism Review, the Clinton campaign intercepted the satellite feed of a Bush commercial 36 hours before the commercial aired on network television. But here's what Clinton economics could mean to you. $1,088 more in taxes. $2,072 more in taxes. By intercepting the feed, Clinton strategists had the ability to respond to Bush's ad before the ad had ever aired. Four years ago, he asked you to believe him. Read my lips. Now he's asking you to believe his attacks against Bill Clinton. This is a satellite feed of a Clinton rally. The person you just heard speaking was probably one of Clinton's security team standing near an open microphone on the stage. The instructions he was giving may have come from Clinton's staff in Little Rock, which regularly monitored the feeds of Clinton's rallies. Go 
Little Rock would watch the satellite feed of the Clinton camera slowly panning the audience like a surveillance camera. If they saw a protester at the public event, Little Rock could call the rally site to alert security. But whenever we did a live satellite feed of like a big rally or something, it was a really very interesting instance. The Buffalo rally, there were some protesters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Little Rock saw it where the advance people couldn't because they were backstage. So the desk, Dwight and those guys called the advance people on the phone and said, no, walk 10 feet to the left. There's a sign in the camera shot there. Edge that guy over. I mean, so it's like Little Rock directed Buffalo and watched it dismantle on television. Fabulous. They watch the dismantling of a problem. Right, right. And they, you know, where the advanced person is in a sea of 2,000 oh, right, people, right, right. Little Rock was able to say, Move to, I can see you on TV. Now go two people over to your left. It was really very fascinating. Hmm. High tech. Yeah, that's good. Um, so that's why when they said there are shadows on your face, that was Little Rock calling and saying, there are shadows on your face. Oh. Yeah. See, everybody walked 